All right. Tonight we're here to talk about really understanding the urban forest in New York City through open data. And the way the session will work is for about the first hour, we'll have a presentation largely focused on a report that our team at the Nature Conservancy released, really leveraging an incredible wealth of data, including data from New York City parks, as well as kind of other agencies in New York City and other data sets beyond New York. After that, we're going to take a short break. I think everyone's on a lot of Zoom meetings these days. We'll take a 15 minute break after this, after the presentation. And there will be Q&A after, right after the presentation is part of that hour. After that break, we'll come back and we'll get into a workshop where our great colleagues at the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation will really showcase a story map that they developed to show to visualize some really important and valuable open data. And then we'll get into walking through how to use some different data sets related to the urban forest, both from the report that we'll be sharing about and from different open data sets on the open data platform and, and beyond. For those of you not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, we're a global conservation organization uh, that operates in all 50 states in about 70 different countries. We've been around since for over 60 years and historically really focused on large landscape conservation, getting land protected through easements or purchasing it. And today we operate in a variety of ways. And in about 2013, we started our first dedicated cities program here in New York City. So our work has evolved as we've gone through time, but we have a large body of work in, here in the city. Elena and Natalia here from our team are part of our uh, New York City's team. We focus on a variety of things. For example, we work green roofs, but a big set of our work is focused on the New York City urban forest. and. This is under a body of work we refer to as the Future Forest NYC effort. We have the State of the Urban Forest in New York City uh, report, which we'll be talking a lot about tonight. We have also worked with partners to develop a group called the New York City Urban Forest Task Force, which put together a really revision and set of recommendations and actions to help support the urban forest becoming as robust as possible. And the, the Urban Forest Task Force has largely evolved to become the future the Forest for All NYC Coalition that works to support the, the New York City urban forest in various ways. Uh, we also engage in stewardship events with local partners, and we're really grateful to have an amazing community of urban forest stewards, researchers, and others in the city that we work with. I've been talking about the urban forest already, and you might be wondering what, what I mean by that. We use a fairly broad definition of the urban forest, and we consider it as the over 7 million trees in New York City as well as the social and physical infrastructure that supports them. This can include really the, you know, people who take care of them, the trees themselves and the soil and the, the tree beds that, they, that help this, help this resource hopefully thrive. And we really care about it for lots of reasons. Largely, we can think about the various benefits that trees provide. Trees remove pollution from the air, but things like particulate matter. They store carbon, especially important given climate change. They help reduce the urban heat island effect. They reduce stress. They help increase community cohesiveness. And they actually absorb stormwater, which is a really important thing in New York City where we have much pavement. And, and of course, trees and you know shrubs that are part of the urban forest provide habitat and refuge for a variety of plant and animal species. We have a big team that works on the urban forestry work, led by our city's program director, Emily Maxwell. It's a a great team that's contributed in different ways to the report, as well as the task force and the coalition. Again, we'll be focusing a lot on the state of the urban forest in New York City report. And this is just, you know, the set of folks who contributed directly on that. And we really want to note that, you know, while the, the folks on the previous slide developed the main content, we had a, an amazing set of expert review and input, including from some folks on the call that I see, so, you know, this work really was informed by and developed from an amazing set of research and knowledge and information. This report covers a wide variety of things. We cover the distribution and physical status of the resource benefits, equity and environmental justice considerations, public policy, funding, management, stewardship, and attitudes. And then we close with the strengths, challenges, and opportunities of the resource. And we're not going to hit on every single one of these topics today, just because it's a thick report. It's a with appendices over 200 pages, but I you know, encourage you to dive into the report and look through any sections that are of particular interest to you. And we're going to really try to leave you with some key, key messages and talk through some of the key open data sets that we used in the process of doing this work. As I noted before, we really leveraged so much incredible knowledge and information, both data from 
the New York City Open Data Portal that ultimately collected by New York City Parks, data available from New York City uh, Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, information from peer-reviewed uh, publications and you know, reports from local agencies and from the USDA Forest Service. We were able to really build on so much information that we were able to analyze for it for this. Before we get into the real meat of this work, I just want to leave you with some key, key takeaways so that if you, you have to leave early or if it's helpful to hear some information at in the beginning of what you need to remember, these are some of the key points. Overall, the urban forest in New York City is has been expanding and is generally healthy. We've seen increases in street trees and tree canopy, and there's a really healthy size and species composition overall, uh, with lots of benefits provided. There are a number of numerous number of committed actors and institutions who help this resource be what it is, providing all these benefits. And over 50% of the tree canopy is actually in New York City Parks jurisdiction and has really robust management, stewardship, and definitely some protections that are, that are notable. But beyond that, most of the remainder is in private property and has relatively few protections and limited formalized management. Some challenges are that the distribution is inequitable. Not everybody benefits from the urban forest in the same way. There's a real uh, patchwork of policies that can be confusing and not, not necessarily protecting the urban forest in the way that it needs. There's often insufficient and unstable funding, and there are major threats, including climate change. So today we've already talked about what the urban forest is and why it matters. We're going to be talking through some key takeaways and data behind them. Then we'll be closing the presentation portion with strengths, challenges, and opportunities. With that, I'm going to pass this, the talk to my colleague, Elena Van Sluden, program specialist, who will talk you through some details of the biophysical dimensions of the urban forest. Elena, you should have control now. Okay, great. Let's hope so. Thanks, Mike. Before I get into some of the findings about the urban forest in New York City, I'm going to introduce a few of the data sets that we worked with. One of the most heavily leveraged data sets in our report is can canopy change from 2010 to 2017. And this is a spatial data set that is available on NYC Open Data. It's made up of polygons that look like this image here, and they show canopy gain, canopy without change, and canopy loss. And so in other words, canopy that hasn't changed is canopy that was present in both 2010 and 2017. Canopy gain is canopy that was present in 2017, but not 2010. And canopy loss would be canopy present in 2010, but not 2017. And from this data set, we're able to derive both canopy change and canopy in each of those years. And this data set is refined from land cover data that is also available on NYC Open Data as a raster uh, data set. And let's see, can I change the slide? It's not flipping, Mike, do you mind doing it? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. And then additionally, we looked at the urban forest across different administrative and political boundaries. Many of these are unique to New York City, such as the five boroughs, as well as neighborhood tabulation areas, which are smaller areas that were created for planning purposes. We also folded in jurisdictional and agency-specific data to understand how canopy falls across public and private land and on certain agencies' areas, please. Then looking at uh, tree canopy distribution for 2017, we found that canopy covered 22% of the city's land area. And at the borough level, the canopy was highest in Staten Island and the Bronx. But when you look at smaller geographies, such as neighborhood tribulation area, it's a bit more complex of a story. You can see here that there's a little bit more variation between high and low areas of canopy. And we found that areas in and around parks, as well as areas in the less densely uh, developed areas in the outer boroughs tended to have higher canopy while well, areas that are pretty densely developed, like Midtown Manhattan, tended to have low canopy, as did the, the airports. And then we can also look at tree canopy across different jurisdictions. While New York City land is roughly 50% publicly owned and 50% privately owned, the, vast, or the majority of tree canopy is on public land much of which is managed by New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. New York City Parks manages trees both on city parkland as well as in right-of-ways, which together means that they're managing over 50% of the city's total canopy, which is significantly larger than their portion of land. And I also would like to point out that 35% of canopy is on private property, which although that's smaller than the portion of land, it's still an important segment of the urban forest. Next, we'll look at how canopy changed from 2010 to 2017. Citywide canopy increased by 2% during those years with increases across all boroughs and site types. 
But similarly to canopy distribution, when we look at a more granular level, there is a bit more variation. You can see that some areas gain, gained more canopy than others. Some areas even lost canopy. And that's especially true in coastal areas of Queens and Brooklyn, which we'll touch on in a second. In areas that gain canopy, there's a few reasons why. Existing trees grow, uh, new trees can be planted, and there's also regeneration, especially in natural areas. Our research indicated that about 87% of new canopy was due to the growth of existing trees. And you can see that in this figure here, where there's the lighter green ring of canopy gain around the darker green existing or no change canopy in the middle. And that meant 13% was likely due to new tree plantings, which you can see look a bit like this so with the, the isolated smaller areas of canopy. And so then canopy loss can be a result of tree death due to pests, pathogens, trees removed for development, as well as simply old age. But one important cause of canopy loss in New York City is extreme weather events. This map here shows how an example uh, shows an area that was heavily impacted by Superstorm Sandy. You can see that many of the flooded areas, which are shown in blue, also suffered large canopy losses, which are shown in white. In addition to data on citywide canopy, we also have data on individual trees or stems. And there's some great open data available here for parts of the urban forest, especially for street trees. Um, street trees are trees that are planted along public rights of way, trees planted along streets, sidewalks, and medians of surface roads. And they're under the jurisdiction of New York City Parks. New York City Parks has led inventories with volunteers and staff collecting data on tree size, species, and location, along with other information, all of which is available on NYC Open Data. And so using the street tree census data, we can start to look at some aspects of the health of the urban forest, including tree size. A healthy urban forest would have young trees that, are, that can grow to replace older ones as they start to die off. Uh, this chart shows the distribution of street tree sizes in Staten Island. You can see that there's a, a large number of these smaller, younger trees. And this trend continues citywide, which is really encouraging and shows that there's a healthy age distribution here. In addition to size, we can also look to see whether there's a healthy species composition. So there are almost 300 types of trees making up our urban forest. And this diversity is really important for resilience since diseases or pests can impact certain species more than that. And the data indicates that diversity is increasing over time with the dominance of the most common species decreasing. And that's a good thing that species are more and more evenly represented. And you can see in this diagram, the top 10 most common street trees in New York City with the London plane tree as the most common. Yeah. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Natalia Piland, who is the interdisciplinary scientist for the Nature Conservancy's New York City's team. Thanks, Elena. We have just heard from Elena about what the urban forest looks like throughout the city in terms of canopy change, jurisdiction, and health, and species diversity and distribution. But as you from Mike's introduction, the urban forest is a really valuable part of our city, not only for its inherent reasons that it exists, but also because of the benefits that it's associated with. This means that the inequitable distribution of the urban forest that we've been hearing about has implications for who gets access to those benefits. One benefit where we can really see this play out is in the role that vegetation plays for temperature. Tree canopy and other vegetation contribute to mitigating the urban heat island effect, a pattern where temperatures in urbanized areas are higher than those in non-urbanized areas. We see this for a variety of reasons, but tree canopy specifically helps with modulating temperatures, particularly in the summer, because where there are trees, it is not paved, and paved surfaces absorb and radiate heat. And this pattern is reflected in these maps. On the left, you can see the distribution of vegetation and on the right, land surface temperatures. You can see that places where there's little vegetation, like airports, have some of the highest surface temperatures. Given that urban forest is inequitably distributed, who then are the people who actually benefit in New York City? To explore this question, the report utilizes data that summarizes socioeconomic characteristics in neighborhood tabulation areas based on the census and creates indices such as the Social Vulnerability Index and the Heat Vulnerability Index for New York City. These indices consider age, income, race, language spoken, not because any particular one of these characteristics are by definition vulnerable, but because the society we live in has historical structures within the landscape and institutions that discriminate against them. 
heat vulnerability index is a New York City specific measure where heat morbidity was looked at in relation to their demographic factors and then an index was created. While social vulnerability index is a countrywide index that characterizes populations at risk during public health emergencies. And both of these can be downloaded. The social vulnerability index is on the CDC website and the heat vulnerability index is found in the Department of Health website for New York City. When we compared the urban forest distribution to the distribution of these indices, we found that generally speaking, neighborhood tabulation areas with low index values had a high tree canopy. Places like the Northwest Bronx or Southern Sand Island. This generally reflects some of the citywide trends, but if we start to look at particular places, we can see some of those place-specific nuances. For example, citywide, higher-income places generally have more trees, but when we look at Manhattan, places with the highest incomes, Midtown, have almost no trees. And this is a reflection of the prioritization of land use and land cover towards high-rise and dense buildings. Similarly, if we look at some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods in the South Bronx and North Brooklyn, you don't see the lowest tree canopy covers, and this is because of targeted tree planting initiatives. Ultimately, many of the distributions of both people and urban forest are legacies of policies and structural conditions. One for an example that is also an active area of research is the effect of redlining. Redlining is a particular behavior that was then codified into policy that has had a very big impact and is increasingly being um, looked into in order to tease this legacy apart. It's the practice of deeming certain neighborhoods as high-risk investments by the Homeowners Lending Corporation, a government agency that was active in the 1930s to 1950s. Using a standardized methodology, the HOLC made assessments based on neighborhood demographics to decide whether neighborhoods were high or low risk. In most cases, if neighborhoods' residents were Black or if they were immigrants or both, the HOLC assessed them as high-risk grade D neighborhoods and mapped them as red hence redlining. Banks, both public and private, use these assessments to approve loans for homeowners. And folks that lived in or wanted to buy in grade D neighborhoods were systematically denied loans for decades after the HOLC stopped producing these maps. These maps are also easily accessible, particularly through the project mapping inequality. Research has shown that without the ownership of a property or financial means or investment in a neighborhood, trees aren't taken care of or planted. In our report, we find the grade A neighborhoods, particularly in the Bronx and Staten Island, have the highest tree canopy covers across the city. The history of spaces have impacts on the people and the urban forest distribution. Personally, place that equity is now a common topic to talk about in conservation work generally. As we in this room think about what we can learn about the urban forest from the vast sources of data available and what that means for its expansion, I want to take a moment to note that there has been recent progress in increasing the canopy cover and its benefits in neighborhoods that are most vulnerable. In particular, the Cool Neighborhoods Initiative and Trees for Public Health have in large part been one of the reasons for the pattern I mentioned earlier of moderate tree canopy covers in the South Bronx and North Brooklyn. As the urban forest expands, there are some disservices that the urban forest can also give. Folks can be worried about the risks that trees bring when they're not well maintained, such as falling branches, or the gentrification that can follow urban greening when not accompanied by other housing measures. Ultimately, local voices should be involved in the decision making and planning for the urban forest. I'll now pass it off to Mike, who will give us some more context on current policies, funding, and stewardship for the urban forest. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalia and Delia. One part of the report that we delved into was uh, what kinds of po public policy exist related to the urban forest. And we, we did, did the best survey that we could of what exists at the city, state, and federal levels. And uh, this is a long list. You can definitely read about them in the report. Uh, and I'm just going to hit on a couple of examples of the types of policies that have you know supported the urban forest or affected it, uh, especially in the more recent years. So one key thing was plan uh, plan yc 2030 was the kickoff that supported what was the million trees initiative which basically was a an effort across both public and private property to plant 1 million trees overall and so new york city parks planted about 70 percent of the trees as part of the million trees initiative and then new york restoration project for in partnership with different landowners including in the private realm to plant the remainder. Big initiatives, a mayoral initiative like that can really have impacts. You know, there's also the Cool Neighborhoods NYC initiative, which 
has supported planting in the most heat, in some of the most heat vulnerable uh, communities. There are also statewide actions and plans and programs that support both funding of some of the urban forest in different ways or broader strategic initiatives. There are definitely some federal policies that touch down in New York City. Sometimes it touches down specifically on certain property types, for example, with National Park Service property here in the city. But there is also the USDA Forest Service New York City Urban Field Station that leads a lot of focused on the urban forest, both the biophysical aspect, the trees and habitats themselves, and the people to help care for it. Those policies mean for protection of trees are really various. I'm just coming back to this slide to remind you that about in 53.5% of the tree canopy falls in New York City parks jurisdiction, either as uh, street trees and rights of way or on formal city parkland. And those are areas of the city that have uh, replacement requirements for when trees are removed and clear protocols for how those trees are taken care of. Other City properties, state, federal, and private really vary. 35% of the canopy being in private property generally does not have regulations related to how trees are cared for or, or maintained or protected. The exception is there are some areas in the city that are in certain special purpose districts. These are zoning special purpose districts where there are some regulations and rules related to tree removal and protection in cases of development. On the left is a map of the these special purpose districts. Most of them are in Staten Island. You can see the largest one is the Special South Richmond Development District, but there's a portion of the Special Natural Area District that is up in the north northwestern Bronx, of which there's an image on there. There's huge potential to think about what, what it could mean for the urban forest if some of the protections were expanded to different areas of the city or different property types. As the city, as the urban forest faces challenges of limited protection, there's also limited funding. This is a look at the average expense funding, the non-personnel expense funding related to trees from fiscal year 2018 to 2022. And what we see is that New York City Parks has a very small portion of the total city expense budget, about 0.34% of the total city budget. And the portion that is that actually forestry efforts, it makes it such an even smaller portion, of course, only 0.04% of the total city budget in terms of expense budget goes to supporting urban forestry work in terms of general you know budget numbers. And this is based also on open data that's available on the open data platform, links at the bottom of the slide, and we'll be sharing these slides after. There's also insecure funding. While the previous slide was an average over a few years, this slide shows both the trends in both the expense budget and capital budget that supports things like tree plantings. And we can see that there's a lot of ups and downs through time. And of course, there was a major dip in funding for 2021, given the COVID-19 pandemic. Even before that, there were some real peaks and valleys. And you can imagine it's challenging to plan for long-term care, planting, and maintenance in various ways with really varying budget. And that's because, in general, urban forestry work from New York City Parks is not baselined into the budget. And some expenses in New York City are baselined where they're generally expected to receive a certain amount of funding. And unfortunately, this is an area that there's so much great work to be done and that is done by our New York City Parks Department. And there's not consistent or stable or reliable funding necessarily. Let's look at some of the public realm of funding. It's important to note that there's funding in other public realms to some degree, for example, for agencies that on different properties in different ways. And unfortunately, that data is not very easily easy to track down. But overall, with most of the canopy in New York City Parks jurisdiction, that's a really important set of the to consider. We know there are also some private sources of funding. And this is even tougher to really get a grasp on. We know that sometimes crowdsourcing uh, efforts, such as through the In Our Backyards or IOB platform, can support urban forestry work. There are groups like Partnerships for Parks, that support urban forestry work. And a million trees in New York City had an you know incredible effort of private fundraising with about $30 million raised for, for planting. But this is, again, a small portion of overall what's needed to maintain this resource. When we think about the landscape of management across New York City, it can be really complex. This is just a small snapshot of one part of Manhattan right on the southeastern side of Central Park and surrounding area. 
And this is just intended to give a sample of some of the who's taking care of the trees. The Central Park is owned by the city and it's managed by the Central Park is Park Conservancy and New York City Parks. There are various institutions like Hunter College, which is owned by the state and it's part of the city university system. There's the Park Avenue Mall that is you know, city owned and managed by the Fund for Park Avenue. And so there's just these few examples, and these aren't really hitting on the hundreds of thousands of individual properties with different owners, right? So this is, so it's complex so if you know, backyard trees and front yard trees are often owned and managed or not managed by, you know, individual property owners. Street trees citywide are overall in New York City Parks jurisdiction and cared for by New York City Parks with, with partners. And then forested natural areas, such as the, the Randall and Central Park, for example, as well as more forested areas that you think of as a more wild looking forest are largely cared for by uh, New York City Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy in the city of Parkland. And there are, you know, other stakeholders that take care of them as well. New York City Parks, with over half of the canopy in their jurisdiction, does an incredible amount of, you know, work to manage this resource. From routine pruning and inspections of street trees, they have a native plant nursery, and they also work to contract out the growth and, you know, cultivation of, of trees that are, that are planted in New York City in their jurisdiction. There's also a large contingent of volunteer stewardship, often in collaboration and led by New York City Parks and others like the Natural Areas Conservancy. This can range from removal of, inv of invasives, of invasive plants in forest natural areas and planting of, of trees and shrubs there, to efforts to maintain and steward street trees through taking care of the tree beds so that the soil can be aerated. Uh, and we know that there's a real wealth of environmental stewardship groups uh, in New York City. This is a, a figure from the STUMAP project from the USDA Forest Service Urban Field Station, where they really work to assess the stewardship groups in New York City who work on the environment in different ways. And one of the really powerful things that they've done in this work is not just identify the different types of groups, whether they're civic, school, government, or business, but they've been able to look at the relationship between the groups. And you can see that the, this is a network diagram it's called. And at the middle is New York City Parks, which really serves as an important hub in different ways for lots of different stewardship groups. With, and I think one of the reasons that we see so much stewardship in different groups working on the New York City urban forest and other environmental spaces, is that there's evidence that people really like trees in nature. We did our work, the best we, work we could to understand based on literature what people's attitudes are towards the urban forest and we see overall that people have positive attitudes towards the resource and there's a lot of work to be done we don't really know what individual property owners maybe feel about trees on their property or outside of their property but this you know, these images are a suite of street signs or uh, signs and street tree builds made by often local residents that really convey enthusiasm for their street trees and in the early years of Million Trees in New York City, there was work, there was correspondence collected about the plantings and we see a variety of responses. And while most of the responses were complaints, we actually don't know what drove those complaints. Complaint isn't necessarily that people don't like the urban forest or the trees, but maybe they have concerns. We can think about similar things, 311 data, also on open data related to the urban forest. A complaint or a service request about a tree is not necessarily that somebody dislikes it. It actually might mean that somebody cares about it deeply. This is really an, an area that there's lots more uh, work to be done in terms of understanding how people uh, feel about this resource. And I mentioned before, a large set of the canopy is on private property, about 35%. And we really don't know what people feel about, how people feel about trees on their properties. That's a large portion of the canopy that's generally unprotected. So far, we've shared some what the urban forest is and why it matters, some key takeaways and some data behind them. And we're just going to hit on some strengths, challenges, and opportunities for this resource. So overall, we see that we have a really healthy and expanding urban forest with a variety of trees that are becoming more evenly distributed in terms of the species composition. That's largely thanks to work by New York City Parks and others to think about how to make the resource more resilient. There's a diversity of people and institutions that steward this resource and really strong leadership from New York City Parks in, in, this, in, in this sphere. And there are also a lot of ex 
opportunities for expanding the resource he expansion that we haven't covered today in this talk, but we've got some forthcoming work about that. There are also a set of challenges that the urban forest faces. There's a real inequitable distribution of it, as Natalia highlighted. And so that means that people are not necessarily benefiting in the same way in different places. There's a patchwork of policies that, you know, may be complex and challenging for folks to understand and does not fully protect the resource or protect it very much. There's insufficient and insecure funding. There's limited knowledge of what New Yorkers specifically think. A lot of the knowledge that we know about attitudes is from other places. And as in Superstorm Sandy, in that image that you saw from Elena, trees are susceptible to storm events and other effects of climate change, like heat waves, as well as pests and diseases that can be exacerbated by, by climate change. The really exciting thing, though, is that we have a coalition, the Forest for All NYC Coalition, really working to act and take actions to support this resource and the New York City Urban Forest Agenda that lays out a vision for a healthy, resilient, and equitable urban forest to support New York City. And one of the key actions of the agenda is actually to achieve 30% canopy cover by 2035. You may have heard announcements recently from that the borough president's offices are working on a campaign for another million trees effort. There's a lot of energy that I'm really excited to see where it goes and how this incredible resource can be supported. Before we begin to some question and to some Q&A, I want to highlight, we've done a lot of analysis in this report and we've uh, made available supplemental results data files, basically spatial data and non-spatial data that show by borough, by a community district, neighborhood tabulation area and community district, things like the street tree type dynamics and canopy dynamics across the city, as well as some equity data. There's also some information, some data available for you to download and use on canopy by jurisdiction and ownership and whether it's in natural areas or not. And then we have some detailed workflows, not just in an appendix of the report, but also available on GitHub at this link here. Uh, this is, you know, one example of a street tree that I think is what a lot of us might see with a street tree. This is unfortunately as lots of weeds going, growing out of it and dogs using the, the, the tree bed and dog can make it tough for a tree, but it is a great example of a tree that could probably use some, some stewardship and just, it's a, and a, all right. I see a hand up from Jody. Hey there. Oh, so many questions. One of the things I did put in the chat, cause you mentioned New Yorkers for parks. I was actually formed the Bronx coalition for parks and green spaces back in the turn of the century. And 1% for park was a nice campaign slogan. But we're 22 years down the road. Has there been any real analysis as to what the Parks Department actually needs to maintain and operate parks? Like you mentioned, baselining the budget. I am a budget geek, so I go through the 4,000 pages and find the line items. Has there been any effort to do that? And how can community groups, I'm part of a stewards group. I'm in the middle of super stewards train. What can we do to help make that happen so it's not just this back and forth of, oh, budget cut, head cut, oh, citywide savings plan, and parks department yo-yos like on that graph that you, you show. That's a great question. Thanks so much for bringing it. I think the one area where there's been a really clear set of needs stated is for natural areas in New York City. There is the forest management framework developed by New York City Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy that lays out, I believe it's a 25-year plan that states what it takes in terms of funding and other resources to create a healthy forested natural areas. In terms of other trees, other parts of the urban forest, I know the New York City Park strives for a seven-year pruning cycle. And I don't know how much has been done to really baseline like what is needed for that and other activities. That's a, an important question that we can certainly, we don't, we don't have any direct answer right now, but I think it's something that it can be really helpful sometimes to show what's needed to get a budget. But also I think some of your question was about how can, you know, we see a budget that is really supporting the, the needs. I think, you know, one important dimension is advocacy. There are various advocacy groups and there is the Safer for Parks campaign, for example, that advocates for a budget that supports more work including in the urban forestry realm. And so that has been successful and so that involves working with and calling on legislators and, and others to just see the needs really met. Yeah, I also put in a numerous capital and extensive budget requests through my community board and the responses are always the same. Capital is funded with debt or by a community 
a city council member, putting in for restoration and rehabilitation, natural areas. Some of it is it's hard because you have to figure it out yourself and then teach other people how to do it since you can't really do advocacy for yourself. Mm. I just retired from the botanical garden under sanitation funding. So I'm so excited. I'm not constrained. Reach out to me if you have ideas of things I can do during my retirement to help parks get what it needs. Because natural areas are like the stepchildren. People look at them as, oh, this is not developed. Let's tear it up and put trails in and cut trees down so we can have better views. And so anything I can help to do with my group, I have a good network in the part of the Bronx that has high tree count because we have 50 acres of Riverdale Park and preserves and forever wild here which we worked very hard to do since the 60s. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. I think there's a few questions in chat. One real quick is, uh, is there an online map that shows gains and losses and gains differences? And I think that will come up in the the story map showcase later. And we'll also be able to point you to some of the data that you can use to you know look at that those trends yourself. Another from Danielle is two questions. How will this report be used? And were there any findings from the study that surprised us. I think this work was done as the urban forest agenda was being developed and it was really valuable. We saw it as being really valuable to lay out the information about the urban forest in one place. There's been an incredible amount of work, as you can see from all the, the types of data sources that we used by New York City Parks, the USDA Forest Service, lots of different academic uh, researchers and institutions. And you know, I think this gives everyone a single place to point two of what is the status in a single point in time. And we can show that with these data, what some of the inequities are and, and such. In terms of things that surprised us, of course, that Elaine and Natalia to chime in with any thoughts that they might have. I think for me, it was just a learning experience. I don't know that I had really clear expectations so much as I was like curious to understand the dynamics. Maybe one of the surprises is like how much we don't actually know about stewardship and maintenance and people's attitudes on private properties are realizing how much of the urban forest falls in those realms. That's an area that I'd love to see researched further. Question from Frank, thinking about the unequal distribution of canopy and heat is that, is it more impactful on the city system to get widespread moderate light canopy in low areas or to, or more density in existing canopy? So that's a really great question. Is it better to get some, maybe some canopy maybe in areas that don't have any really or very little, you know, or to make the uh, kind of existing canopy denser. Frank, it looked like you were not, I could think they got that right. That's a complex question. There's been, so the urban heat island effect of the effect of vegetation on heat and heat illnesses is really complex, but there's been some really good work done by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that shows that within about, I don't remember the range, it's a about 600 meters, I think, like vegetation has a, a big impact on reducing temperature. There's a threshold of within at about a 600 meter radius area. I think having 30% vegetation or more is where you start to see benefits in terms of temperature. And that's, and there's other work that's been done in cities on urban forests, maybe 40% canopy that shows showing a decrease from another study. And I think what that ultimately shows that we need these pockets, at least pockets, and some distribution of tree canopy in the areas that have high temperature. Having lots of tree canopy grow and expand in the same parts of the city won't necessarily, won't provide shade to the parts, shade and evapotranspiration and other cooling mechanisms to the parts of the city that don't have tree canopy. And it always takes starting with hunting tree at a time, right? You, growth of existing trees is really powerful, and then you need those existing trees to be planted and cared for to, to grow. Question is, the city council passed a bill to limit the number of replacement trees that are required to be planted by the Department of Parks and Recreation, by individuals and by entities that lawfully remove trees during construction projects in certain lower density residential districts. Will that affect the 30% goal by 2035? I think the short answer is we don't know. Limits the number of trees that are required to be planted. Presumably that will actually that may reduce the number of trees that are planted. It doesn't mean that the trees planted will always go down. I think right, but but in reality, you know, realizing that that very well may mean we have decreased trees planted in, in those neighborhoods. A lot of the lower density residential areas 
are the areas that have a lot of the existing, a lot of more of the existing tree canopy, which can hopefully grow, continue providing benefits. And as we saw, a lot of the tree canopy increase was attributable. So it was on the periphery of, you know, it, of older tree canopy. So it's likely from just growth of trees. I think we may not see that it may impact the healthy age distribution, for example, in those areas, if maybe the same number of younger trees aren't planted. It's tough to say what will happen in the longer term. Mike, do you mind if I follow up from that? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a few times so not maybe knowing much about what just everyday citizens or New Yorkers are thinking or feeling. I feel like I'm bringing that to this discussion. And I will say that as someone who's tried very hard to get trees planted or contact the parks department about tree beds or trees themselves that are in trouble or are being wrapped around with lights or the whole thing, I'll be honest, I haven't found it a great interaction with the parks department. I found it really challenging and don't bother us. And maybe they don't have enough money and I get that, but it feels like if they're not going to have enough money and you do have New Yorkers who care about and want trees and want the ones that exist to be cared for, that maybe there needs to be better communication and ways for the parks department to like partner with, is it neighborhood groups? Is it community boards or something? I just feel like even if you do care, it's really hard to get anything addressed or done. And when you, and one thing I'll just add in, it's very anecdotal, but the seven year pruning thing, they subcontracted to some company and they came through our entire neighborhood and butchered all the trees. And it was, it was horrible. There was no discrimination about what they really needed. And it's not like I ever got any feedback about what they were going to try to do. I, I don't know. It was just, it was, n none of the experiences have been like, oh, I'm so glad I reached out and tried to do something. So I think it sounds like funding is a big issue and they're understaffed and they have a lot to do. And I'm just curious about whether the parks department itself can partner more or better, if that makes sense. And maybe that's not a question for this forum, but I'm going to throw it out. Just a regular person who's trying to care about trees in the city and not just in my own neighborhood either. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you very much, Donna, for bringing and sharing your experiences. I think everyone has different experiences and feelings and thoughts about the urban forest and the energy that you're bringing and the care that you're bringing for trees and in your area is so valuable. And thank you for bringing that energy and excitement and care. I definitely can't speak for, for New York City Parks. I think it's it takes a village in lots of ways. And it, in addition to New York City Parks, there are other great groups. Trees New York works a lot on tree stewardship, working to organize volunteer events with street trees and train citizen traders. And so basically, uh, certain tree care activities for street trees. The only people outside of contracted staff for New York City Parks staff that can do it is are people with a citizen pruder's license that's offered through training as a through training by uh, Trees New York. I think it's important to just think about all the different groups that are working in the sphere. Thanks again, Donna, for just you know sharing your experience. I think that's really aren't, aren't all this aren't all the street trees under the city parks? Yeah, street trees are yeah. I feel like you you can only work with the parks department if you're talking about city trees. As uh, street trees that is. Right. Oh just saying, and that is just saying that Trees New York works they're a nonprofit that works on a suite of different trees and they actually are work with New York City Parks to offer the certification for a citizen trainer so that you know, people with the certification can do certain activities on the street tree, like some limited pruning, for example. I see Natalia, thank you so much for putting in the chat the link to the Forest for All in My Sea Coalition. And I think we're going to take, and I see there's uh, also a comment from Hannah about the stewardship team at New York City Parks, hosting volunteers events. We're just over beyond the six o'clock right now. Let's take our 15 minute break and come back and we'll hear from our colleagues at New York City Parks about the story map that they developed. And uh, we'll get to chat a lot more about open data uh, related to the urban forest. So All right. Now this workshop will start with New York City Parks showcasing our story map of New York City urban forest data. Then we're going to get into covering some of the summarized data from the report that we've made available. And depending on time and interest, we can cover some additional topics of uh, canopy and canopy change data, street tree census data, and some of the equity data used in the report. We've made a quick reference sheet about all of these data. 
available online. I also want to really note that it, we're really excited about the story map that our colleagues at New York City Parks have put together. The data about the urban forest are really complex. There's a lot of nuances to it. And you know, we've been really lucky to work with them to understand the data rigorously and accurately. And are glad that this story map that they're about to talk about is available for you all to really start visualizing the data, you know, without having to work with any technical tools. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to our colleagues at New York City Parks. Hi, everyone. My name is Uma. I am the acting director of the analytics team at NYC Park. Um, at the Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources Division. I'll be presenting some of the work that I did on the story map, but really the main person behind it is Kurt Federholm, who is also on my team and worked on this for a very long time to bring all this analysis to you guys. We're excited to present. And of course, we also have Fiona Watt with us, who is the senior advisor to the assistant commissioner and was really the visionary behind this whole product. Just to give you guys a little bit of background about what the story map product is, it's a interactive narrative. It lets you in, um, have multimedia content. You can import maps, images, charts, etc. in a way that you can make it interactive. You can engage in your users um, in a dynamic way. And the beauty of it um, in spirit of Open Data Week is that it can be shared with the public. It can just be shared with the organization if you'd like it to just it's great in that it's scalable with who you want to share your information. And it's built using an Esri platform called StoryMap. We had several goals in building this story map, story map, some of which I'll share with you. And really the first and foremost was to educate and engage the public. One, on just our urban forest. Mike was mentioning earlier, we managed a little over half the canopy in the city. Um, we wanted to show you all that, how we do it, the benefits and the challenges that come with managing um, this canopy and about, again, as people have mentioned in the chat, how they wanted to get involved. And so we've included information exactly on how you can do that. And we also want to communicate what it is we actually do to take care of these trees and provide public services. We really get into different examples of the way we provide public service and um, want to show you that. And also to contextualize this information in a com in a way that you can compare against different geographies. If you want to compare it against your neighbor, et cetera, to see how you fare against others in terms of canopy in a way that um, then you can use to advocate for more trees in your neighborhood if you so prefer or see more services if you feel like you're not getting them. And it is a lot of information, and that's because we want it to be as useful as it can to the widest range of audience possible. Citizens, but not only citizens, but also elected officials, stewardship groups, community nonprofits, et cetera. The way the uh, story map is structured is it's centered around the New York City tree canopy. And I want to make a quick distinction here that the story map focuses on street trees and landscaped park trees. And that's the distinction between forest trees, forest trees, um, and those uh, trees in those types of areas, like wetland forests, et cetera, although we do manage some of those, they are not represented um, in the story map. The scope is focused just on street trees and, and landscape trees. And so we show you one, why you should care, all of that, like we said, all the benefits um, that they provide and what we have, like where are the trees, where is the canopy, um, broken down by all these geographies. We also show you how it's changing. As Mike mentioned, we have this canopy data that was collected, a LIDAR collection that was done in 2010. Another one was done in 2017. And so we have these two really rich data sets. We can draw a lot of insights from and see how it's changed over time. So we show you that as well. And finally, we show you who cares for it, us, but also you guys, also the stewards and the work that they do and how we care for it. A quick outline um, of the story map. You can see our section headings here. Again, why they matter. The tree canopy, it's broken down into canopy as a whole and summarized by some jurisdictional data. So trees and canopy that we have jurisdiction over, that's private, that's in the right of way. And then again, similarly with tree canopy change within that seven years, we show where it's grown, where it's where we and then we just show you tree count, not just canopy, not just the area of the canopy, but just the individual tree trees where they are summarized by the geographies. And then we really focus on the work that we provide and the work we do to care for this urban forest. And so Service requests are the 311 calls that you call in that go into our system. We show you where they come in, 
how we inspect them, how we create work orders based off of them. And this data focuses on, on fiscal year 21. And fiscal year is just a budgetary way of looking at the calendar year it's from uh, July to June. And then again, how can you get involved? So this story map is really content heavy. There's um, 85 distinct maps and we're not done. We are still working on a few more maps to put in, put in there. So it's a really robust product. And the reason is because we want to summarize all this data I just talked about at various different levels. We look at in five different geographies. We want to roll it up at a borough level. You can look at it that way and then really drill down all the way to your census block, which is just a little chunk of road. Maybe that's outside your apartment. And then in those last four geographies, you can also keep zooming in to look at that tree canopy layer that we have talked about. You can see the polygon outline and it's symbolized by whether it was a gain from 2010, whether it was a loss from 2010, et cetera. You really get super granular as you zoom in and learn that information. Along with the maps themselves, there are various pop-ups for each of the geographies. You have comparative data that's shown there. It'll show you how whatever geography you're looking at compares to the rest of them in terms of percentages, in terms of area. And then when we get into the tree services section, again, you can compare how much work we've done in your area versus some other area. If you're just curious to know, if, you know, about the services we're delivering, all this data is in there. Some use cases for the story map, I think Mike was going through some of them, just all this open data is out there. And so we wanted um, to highlight, this is one way that we have summarized the data for you, served up for you in, in this format, but what are some of the use cases that, that, that cover this, that are covered by this data? And some of these are listed here. And we have three specific scenarios that we want to go through with you. And I'm actually excited because some of you have brought up questions that overlap with our use cases. So for some of for the answers that you might be seeking, maybe you just need to go to the story map and take a look and there'll be some information for you there. Of these, we'll just go through three, but there's there's these and, and I'm sure others that we aren't thinking of and other ways that you can use this data that we're presenting to you. So I'm gonna um, now hand it over to Kurt, who was the project lead on building all this. So he has all the answers. Thanks, Uma. Yeah, so I'm going to lead everyone through a demonstration of the story. It is a very dense product. There's a ton of information in it, so we're not going to get to everything, but we'll just use these three scenarios to go through the story and, and lead us into some things. So yeah, we initially started with some high-level questioning that would get us into the story, but we thought it might be more engaging to come up with some hypothetical scenarios. I'll just lead everyone through three of these scenarios. Our first scenario is going to involve existing canopy. And so the scenario we came up with is you and your partner currently live in the East Village and you've recently had a baby. You love the tree line street that you live on, but you want to move to a more fa family friendly neighborhood in Brooklyn. It's important to you that you continue to live on a tree line block with a beautiful canopy because you can feel how much it impacts your mood. How do you start selecting? Brooklyn neighborhoods that might meet your, your canopy criteria. So we'll jump into the story here. Here's our landing page. We are looking at a beautiful shot down Eastern Parkway here. And so as you scroll through this, you can see that the, all of our sections are anchored to the top here and you can click on these, which will jump you to our different sections. In our first scenario, we are mostly concerned with existing tree canopy. We can, we can click on that and it'll bring us to our tree, existing tree canopy section. As we scroll, images and maps will come up on the right side and the narrative is on the left side. We can learn about how this data was collected. We can get some higher level metrics on each borough's share of canopy. And so we've come to our first map which is total canopy, total New York city tree canopy. And we have, we start with in all 17 of our maps, we start with a borough level map, and then we can click through to the other four geographies. We have neighborhood tabulation areas. We have community boards and we have council districts. And we also have census blocks. This first map is total canopy cover, which might not be as appropriate for our scenario because that includes backyards, it includes cemeteries, and it might not give you the neighborhood's characteristics. We can keep going and we can see that canopy 
canopy under parks jurisdiction falls into two categories. We have right of way canopy, which is basically street trees, trees growing along sidewalks, um, streets, traffic triangles, et cetera. And then we have parkland canopy, which is includes all canopy growing in New York City parkland properties. As we scroll, we have some diagrams that illustrate that point. We have tree canopy that is that that is under New York City parks jurisdiction. But what would probably give us the best answer for our first scenario is tree canopy in the right of way. And so that is, as I mentioned, canopy on streets and sidewalks, et cetera. As we scroll, we can, we get to our right of way canopy map. And so in our scenario, we mentioned that we live in the East village, so we can zoom in and our neighborhood names will come up. And so we're in the East village. We have a 27% canopy cover in the right of way in the East village, which is pretty good. It's in the fourth highest class in our Cora plot. We can see that we and we also want to live, let's say we want to live near Prospect Park and we want to have at least a similar right of way canopy cover. And we can see that around Prospect Park, there's quite a few neighborhoods that have that criteria, but we have visited Prospect Heights in the past. And so we can take a look at that neighborhood and we see fantastic. This has an even higher right of way canopy cover. Um, in fact, 5% higher which is great. And so as you zoom in and this functionality is in every map at a certain scale, your selected geography will turn off, but the outline of that geography and the name of it will remain. We're in prospect tights here, and we can see that there's at least three blocks here that have the highest level of right-of-way canopy cover. We can take a look at these blocks. This, this block has a 61% um, canopy cover in the right of way. And so these other two, so we can continue to zoom and at the next scale, our 2017 tree canopy polygons show up and we can continue to zoom and get a clearer picture of the canopy specifically on some, on blocks that we might want to look at apartments for. And so we can zoom back out. We can start with a different geography. We can start with census block if we want. I'm going to move on to our next scenario. Scenario two is going to deal with canopy change, and it's going to be through the perspective of a reporter covering the recent million more trees announcement um, by the five borough presidents. And let's say you want to reference the first million trees initiative in your article, and you're curious how a New York City's urban forest might be changing over time. Has the forest expanded or contracted? And where have these changes been most pronounced? So we're going to jump back over to our story and we can jump to our tree canopy change section. Um, the first thing that comes up is this slider application, which will show you specific tree polygons and outlines, and will also show you how they changed. We can see the legend here, dark green is gain, pink is loss, and a lighter color green is no change. And so we can, we can look at this in our neighborhood, but I think for this scenario, we would probably want a more generalized view of the issue. We can look at loss specifically. We can look at gain specifically, but what is most important here is probably net change. We can come to our net change map and we can see that the city as a whole gained 1.7% canopy in that time period, Staten Island being the highest borough and Let's say that we are specifically concerned with HVI five neighborhoods. We can take a look at the at heat vulnerability index maps. We see that the South Bronx, Northern Manhattan neighborhoods, and some Eastern Brooklyn neighborhoods are all um, of the most in the most vulnerable and and fall within that five classification. So we can take a look at this through a community board lens, and we see. There's some variation across the city, but we can see right away that in those places I just mentioned, we see that they have, we see that they have the highest class of net canopy change. But we can see that in community board 316, we gained 3.1% 3 3 canopy, which is significantly better than the borough and significantly better than the citywide gain during that time period. And we can also see 
that the coastal community boards that were impacted by Hurricane Sandy have had significant canopy loss down here. All right, I'm going to move on to our third scenario here, which is going to involve tree services. In our hypothetical scenario, you are a city council member and you're advocating for an increase in the parks department's budget. A community member in your district questions your support for parks. How do you respond and how do you show your constituents what the agency does for your district? We will jump back over to our story here. When I say tree services, I am referencing these three sections. We have service requests, inspections, and work orders. So we can jump to service requests and we can see that as we scroll through here, we have a service request map and let's look at this in terms of a council district. And let's say that we are in Council District 26, which is Island City, Story, I think Sunnyside as well. And we can see that in 2021, in fiscal year 2021, there were over 2,200 service requests in this council district. And we have a little bar chart here. We can see that requests for limb down were the highest, the highest service request category. We can then move on to our inspection section and an inspection involves a certified forester actually going into the field and looking at the tree and making a decision on what to do with it. We can come to our inspection section and we can we can click on council district and go to back to our our district of 26 and we can see that in that same year there were 1200 inspections in that council district. We can also see that the highest category in the inspection section is tree and limb down as well. That is, that is, that's trees being inspected. And next is our work order section. We can move to uh, the work order section. That is, this is actually, this is actually where, how work actually gets done. It's removing split and failing trees, removing hanging limbs, pruning, picking up debris, et cetera. We can scroll down to our work order section and our work order map, and we can go to the same council district of 26. And we can see that in that same year, we did 1700 work orders in this council district. And we can also see that outside of block pruning, limb down was the highest work order category in that. We can see that we are actually responding to service requests from the public. We can also see if we go to census block, we can see, so each of these polygons has at least a single work order in it. And we can see that we are, we are making it to the majority of the city it, it, in at least that has at least one work order in it. And we can zoom in and take a look at our council district area. And we can see that these census blocks have 30, 30 plus work orders in some of them. That's just a very quick demo of the story there. Like I said, it's a very dense product and there's a lot in here. Also just want to mention that we have a get involved section that references some of the stewardship programs that were mentioned earlier. And we have a, an about section that describes a little bit about our classification, what is in our base map, some definitions on functional parkland, dominant type, et cetera, and, and who built it. I think with that, I will turn it back over to Mike, or I guess we can open it up for any questions on the story. Let's see. Danielle, are the data layers being loaded directly from the NYC open data site, or did you load them into ArcGIS online? These are, these are web maps that are created and hosted on ArcGIS online. Second question here is, will the maps and charts be updated manually or automatically? So they will be updated manually. The tree services section after when it is finished, we will update those manually. I do want to point out that even though we did load the uh, data sets into ArcGIS online, all this data is also available on NYC Open Data. If you, you could build this yourself if you so wanted. There's not any propriety data that we're using. Yep, great point. This is all available on NYC Open Data. The URL will be publicly accessible. We'll share that with everyone here. I'll update it annually. To clarify, some of the data will be updated manually. The canopy data... I think we'll have to probably wait for another LIDAR collection to get some of that data or for another tree count for some of that data. I'll just add for people to keep in mind as you're going through the story map, 
that the nature of the maps are chloroplasts. They're these summaries of polygon areas. You might be looking at a right-of-way map, a map that just summarizes the right-of-way data, but you might see that Prospect Park looks like it has the most canopy class in the right-of-way. And that only means that within that polygon that is Prospect Park, the part of the Prospect Park polygon that has just a little bit of right-of-way is actually very um, densely canopy. The whole polygon would be represented in that class. Just spatially and intuitively, you have to remember when you're looking at a core play that it is a polygon representing a summary of just the metric that the map is representing. So when you're looking at the entire canopy chloroplasts, that's all the canopy in front yards and backyards in right of way on parkland that happens to be within that polygon. But when you're looking at a map that is specific to parkland, and we didn't show you, but there's a full series of maps that just summarizes parkland, again, within these polygons at the census block or the council district or the community board, the neighborhood. That's not to say that the parkland obviously occupies that whole polygon. It's just a summary of what parkland is within that polygon. Just a little caution for when you're looking at these maps to bear in mind what they represent and what they don't represent. And then I think there was a comment about coordination between the Nature Conservancy and our team on this. And ironically, we really came to these products separately. Again, in, in many ways, thanks to open data, our initial drive was to share more broadly the tree services that we do every, that we confer every year. A lot of people don't necessarily think about trees until there's a problem. And we wanted to be able to show people the volume of service requests that we receive and the types of inspections and tree work that we do and how it's spatially distributed. But then, of course, the 2017 LIDAR showing the land cover of New York City and the work that was done to compare the 2017 to the 2010 LIDAR in terms of the tree canopy change layer is just such a rich data set. And we really wanted to, to bring that out in an interactive form for everyone to explore. And so it's just a really nice compliment um, the work that was done in the voluminous and more academic, the state of New York City's urban forest by the Nature Conservancy. And then this tool, which is really meant to serve a lot of different purposes and just share all of these rich data sets with anyone who's interested. And I'll just add on to that. Thanks so much, Fiona, for that. Now, I think that New York City is really rich in open data related to the urban forest. At the Nature Conservancy, we have colleagues, you know, across the country who work in different cities. And some of them are asking about why we did this report, but some of them are also asking, it, how did you do this report? Because the amount of data that we have here, just the high quality canopy and canopy change data and the street tree census data, those, you know, really key examples just don't exist for that many cities. So very few cities have, you know, one, let alone two years of really high quality canopy data. I think one of the challenges that I think about for the city is how do we make sure that we can continue tracking these effort, these, these metrics through time? How can we make sure that there's an updated tree canopy data so that in five or 10 years, we can uh, really accurately and precisely track change as ongoing efforts are taken are underway. For example, a million more trees initiative. I'll note that there are some of those different examples of tree canopy products. And if they're not developed using the exact same underlying types of underlying data and methods, they're not necessarily comparable. It's really important to that forethought is given to how we can make sure we are tracking these things through time. So, yeah. I think that's all we had on our side. Thank you for hosting us, Mike. We really appreciate it. Great. Yeah, no problem. And I know, let's see, there's a new question of when do we expect there to be another LiDAR data set? I don't believe there's any commitments for one, but uh, if anyone else has any other information on that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start talking a little bit about some of the more raw open data that folks can get in and use and visualize, you know, on their own rather than, you know, working with the, the the story map, I think some people really want to start looking at trends and maybe doing data analysis. And so you know, we have to want to work through some, walk through some of the data sets that you, know, you can download and work with on your local computers and, and start visualizing. And I'm going to put a link into chat to a reference sheet that we developed for these data sets. And what I'm showing now is just the reference sheet that I just linked. There's some overview information and then kind of sections about the different types of data that we can think about or some of the core data sets. 
And we won't get through all of these tonight, but I want to hit on a, a couple of things. In particular, there's the, as we released the State of the Urban Forest in New York City report, we went to make these data, it makes kind of summary results files available so that, you know, anyone who's interested could start, you know, plotting these data. And when we re-released this report, there were actually requests from journalists to see the data so they can like sort by the most gain or the most canopy. And it was really valuable to actually have these data sets ready to go so that journalists, among others, could start using them. And some supplemental data sets that we've released are available on a open data repository. It's a separate repository that is funded through the 2030s by CERN in Europe. It's more of an academic kind of platform for publishing open data with the kind of underlying principle of just long-term provenance and citability. It has a unique identifier for the, the set of information. This URL is in the uh, slides as well as in the that co-reference sheet. And we have you know a suite of data sets that are available. These are in zipped files that you can download. If you scroll down, you'll see you know, the different zipped files available for download. And there's one of canopy jurisdiction land use by borough. And you know, so each of these files, we tried to make really clear like what, what's in them. All right, so this first one has information about land area and canopy area by approximate ownership type, land use categories, and whether land is natural or developed, natural being like more forested, natural areas and wetlands, whereas de developed could even refer to pavement or grassy manicured areas. I think one of the things that would be of maybe most interest is this set of data of canopy and street tree summaries, which contain kind of the summary data from the results of our report with canopy information, with canopy area, canopy gain, loss, and change by uh, neighborhood tabulation area, community district, city council district, and borough, as well as street tree data for those areas. So that some of the equity data that we covered in our report and compared with the urban forest is available. And this is all aggregated to the scale of the neighborhood tabulation area. And then we have information specifically on natural area. This is what the data, where you can grab these data. And I'm just going to walk through at least the canopy street tree summaries folder so you can get a sense of what's in there and how you might interact with it. This, so you should all be able to see the Windows set of folders and files now. And this is, so basically, if you download any of the files, they'll come as zipped files and you could unzip them. And so there's the street tree, canopy street tree summaries. And all of these types of folders, all of these zipped folders, have data dictionaries, which in which we tried to they have really clearly what different columns are in the data, both as a Word document and as a kind of uh, web page document that just opens up in your browser, right? So this data dictionary indicates what the different files are in this folder, right? So the information is available by borough, community district, and council district, and neighborhood tabulation area. Those are all what are called comma separated values files that you can open up in Excel or other free spreadsheet software. And then there are spatial data as well, the geo package and geo file geo database, which can contain the same data, just in different formats. All of those layers are in one. If we open up the comma separated values file in my computer, it opens up by default in Microsoft Excel. And so you can see there's the information on the borough, 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 borough code and borough name how big each of these units is, the amount of canopy loss between 2010 and 2017, gain and no change, the total acreage of canopy in 2010 and 2017, change in acres, the percentage, right? So all the thing I've talked about so far is acreage, but also the percentage of canopy in these different areas, the net canopy change in terms of percent, relative change, basically comparing the difference from 2010 to 2017, compared to what the canopy level was in 2010. For example, in Brooklyn saw the greatest relative change as a whole borough, and it had basically the greatest increase compared to how much it had in 2010. That's what that means. Then we have data from the street tree census that we aggregated by these geographies, right? So the total numbers of street trees, the ones that were recorded as not stumps, the ones that were recorded specifically as alive, 
And then the most common species. In the report, we do some work to highlight the stocking rate or the kind of basically how many how, of the total capacity for street trees in every geography, how many street trees there actually are. And so we have that in here as well. I'm just looking for the rate column, the stocking rate column Z is where that is. But another metric that we started to look at and didn't present in the report is basically what is the density of street trees per road mile? Since street trees are along certain types of roads, we can, and we have available road data for New York City, we can look at what is the total mileage of roads of certain types in each geography? What is the amount of living trees? And then we can look at the, the density of street trees per road mile, which second rate, which living trees per road mile is a column S here. This is just another metric that we can use to start thinking about where are, where do you see the most, the highest density of, of streets? As I mentioned, you're right. So, in, and so you can use the different types of plotting tools in Excel to plot these data non-spatially. And then in this, in the folder that we downloaded, there are also the spatial data sets. I mostly use a tool called QGIS. A lot of folks might use that or ArcGIS. And I see a great question of, does anyone know a rule of thumb for max trees per road mile? And that's something I've not come across. If anyone has any information, I'd love to feel free to chime in, but it's just, you know, a, another way we can think about trying to standardize how we're comparing different areas. Every way we might think has some different challenges. I can think of some areas, for example, where the sidewalks are very narrow and there just isn't really much room for street trees in the space where they'd normally, normally be planted. But so I'm going to go to the GIS windows. This is QGIS. It's just a, another kind of finding tool that you might think of similar to ArcGIS. And I'm just going to bring in, I'll bring in the geo package file. If I just drag and drop and it gives me the option to bring in all of the layers that are in that geo package and I'm going to click add layers. It's just making, there's lots of different ways to spatially transform data. And in general, you can, if you see this, you can click okay. And so now we see, you know, the data by borough, by community district, by city council district and by neighborhood tabulation area. And so for, I'm going to sit on neighborhood tabulation area for a moment and we can make a core of left, like you were seeing in the, uh, story map presented by our colleagues at New York City Parks. So I'm just going to style the data in a way that's, that helps convey that. I'm going to uh, style it as a graduated, so it'll kind of increase, change the color with the value. And I'm going to do by canopy 2017% classify, and let's make it green and apply. And so now you can see the choropleth of the canop of canopy by neighborhood tabulation area. Right, so you can do that kind of thing with all the different variables that are in the, this layer. I'm doing this in QGIS, but you can also bring the data into ArcGIS or work with it in R or Python or other preferred tools to do similar work as well as more complex analyses. Back to the kind of supplementary data files. The ones with spatial data like this are the canopy street tree summaries and the equity data, which I'm just going to bring in for a moment. And, you know, in QGIS, and it, you can open its attribute table, we have the neighborhood tabulation area code name, what borough it's in, all that same information on the acreage. This canopy information is actually based on a, the neighborhood tabulation areas plus a quarter mile. Basically, we were trying to recognize that people benefit from tree canopy that's adjacent to the area that they live in, especially maybe if they live adjacent to a park, the neighborhood tabulation area may end at the boundary of the park, but the people may still be benefiting from that section of the urban forest that's there. And then the stocking rate for street trees, and then a suite of socioeconomic and demographic data from the social vulnerability index and heat vulnerability index, which are all documented in the data dictionary. Right. So this is per capita income, poverty rate, the kind of percentage of residents older than 65 or greater than 65 or older and, and similar. These are specific components of a social vulnerability index, the SPL themes one through four. And then there's the heat vulnerability rank, right? This is all ready to go in 
available for analysis and visualization. So those are some of the kind of key supplemental data sets that I wanted to highlight. I think, again, you can look through the uh, quick reference sheet that we've provided and we'll follow up with by email. So you can dig into this a little bit more on your own. Really, there's so much open data out there. I just want to cover a few other kind of elements of the open data. Elena highlighted the tree canopy change data set, you know, and this is really clearly visible in the story map from New York City Parks. Uh, and the, so you can download the data, you know, and this link is in the, the quick reference sheet. And when you download the data, it, you can, you'll be able to unzip it and it downloads as a file geodatabase. And this is pretty large. It's a gigabyte and a half. Some of these data sets get quite large, right? But this is again, just right off of open data and ready to use and visualize in your favorite GIS tool. And so this is not a tooling that's available in a, just a table that you can start using, but you can overlay this with whatever kinds of boundaries that you're interested in, right? It takes a little bit to render because it is such a big file. I think it has over 5 million polygons in it, if I remember correctly. And in QGIS, it loads without color, color coding it, but we can color code it in QGIS or ArcGIS categorized where we would use the class. So class is where it indicates whether it's gain, loss, or no change. And I'm just going to do this manually. So it will, can take a little minute to load. Let's make colors a little bit more intuitive. And right, so it's green for gain. Loss is, let's do purple. And no change, we can do a darker green. Right, so now you can see that you know, as we zoom in, uh, you can really see very locally where the gain, loss, no change happened. And you can overlay this with different types of, you know, background imagery, including from the city of New York. And so while this allows you to really closely visualize what was happening, you can also overlay these data with those different, with any different political or administrative types of boundaries. I'll note that the neighborhood tabulation areas that we used in their report are from the kind of based on the 2010 census. So every, after every decennial census, they're updated because they're based on uh, population, because the boundaries are intended to have a consistent population within each unit. And so if you really wanted to download the updated neighborhood tabulation areas reflecting kind of boundaries based on the 2020 decennial census, you could download those data from New York City Department of City Planning and use tools in GIS to overlay this canopy data and do similar types of processing and by those updated areas. I'll note that we have some of our workflows from the report are up on GitHub, actually in the same general place where we have this quick reference sheet. This is available in, in the PowerPoint, but it has a lot of documentation of how we did the processing, including different code in R and PostGIS that we used to do some of the processing. And for those who are really into data and working with different tools, this might be valuable to, to look at. If you're interested in doing some similar types of processing and answering the diff all of the wealth of questions that you with these original data. And I'm seeing a comment from Yogi about, you know, in excitement and interest in looking at urban forest data with noise. And I think that's a great question. One of the benefits of trees is that you can really help dissipate loud noises and affect the soundscape as it's called. So. Yeah, one of the other key data sets that I, sets of data that I want to highlight is the street tree censuses. As Elena highlighted, these are, click, have been conducted every 10 years for all of the street trees in the city, uh, starting in 1995. And they take basically two years to complete the, the census. And it's led and developed by New York City Parks with lots of volunteer efforts to contribute data. And the methods and everything has been refined through time, I think. So the data are available on open data, right? These links again are in the quick reference sheet as well as in the PowerPoint. And you can download the data from open data. And for 1995, the data are available as just a tabular data set. I have it opened here. If you go to the export buddy, you can download it as a CSV, a comma separated values file, and then that can open up in a spreadsheet software like Excel. This is the 19, I had downloaded this yesterday, I think, just to remember what it was, look, what it looks like in this, when you download it right away. This is what the data look like, information on the species 
via a code. There are actually spatial coordinates, both in the projected coordinate system and in latitude and longitude. And there's lots of data on what neighborhood tabulation area the tree was in, uh, census box, census tract, community board, council district. This data set is really rich. This data set is not available for download, to my knowledge, in a spatial format. You can bring this in based on the coordinates into GIS. There are definitely some points, some rows of data that the coordinates, I don't believe, were, were fairly, fairly geocoded for. If you're looking to do an aggregation by different types of units, it's really great to be able to use the you know community board field or zip code or as a census tract kind of information. Basically, geocoding is, especially in a place like New York City, can be complex. And that's the kind of process of taking an address, right? So this data were collected based on the address nearest to where the tree fell or tree stood. And you know, then the coordinates are based on the approximation of that address. And it's geocoding in a place like New York City is challenging because we have lots of weird addresses. Now this some of this data have been improved as the subsequent street tree censuses have gone on. So this is the 1995 street tree census data set. The, right, and of course, something that's important with any data set is the metadata. So if you're at the data set kind of homepage, there's an attachment here that has a PDF of the metadata and there's an, a, an explanation of what the columns are right on the web page. These are all the valuable and important things to make sure that you have a sense of what the data are and how you can work with them. We have a, something similar for the 2005 street tree census. The street, this street tree census does have some spatial data available. There's a link again to this on the quick reference sheet. And to actually download this in this, you go to the export button and then select either downloading one of the options for downloading the spatial data or an on spatial type. And then there is also a spatial data set of the 19 of the 2015 street tree census. And I'll note that the 2015 street tree census adopted a new and different way of getting the spatial locations of all of the trees. And so that has really precise kind of information on where the trees are. While in the 1995 and 2005 street tree data, if you plot them, they fall in the road based on the nearest address. The, nine, the 2015 data are actually really precisely good approximations of where the tree beds are. If you're looking to compare through time, you can't necessarily compare on a tree to tree basis, but you can compare the data sets on a, if you're aggregating by different geographic units. So these are some of the core data sets. Then in the quick reference sheet, we have information about some of the equity data that we used. And in particular, we used the social vulnerability data from the CD Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And this is where you would download the data from it. It's it downloaded at the scale of census tract or counties, if you were interested in that. And yeah, either as a shape file, as like a spatial data format, or a comma separated values file. And this is a, has a wealth of information because it has not only the vulnerability indices themselves, but also the different component data, like the things like income and different metrics related to race and language and age for census tracts. Right. And then we also have a link to the heat vulnerability index data for New York City. This is from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Environmental and Health data portal. And on this page, you can hit the export button and it'll result in a, the download of a zip file. And basically when you unzip that, you will actually see a, I've, you will actually see it download as these two file types. I, I just did it before we called this, before this call, it looked a little bit different, but basically the see it comma separated values file, which again, will open it in Excel and it has some metadata in the first 15 rows and then the data of for each NTA, you know, what the rank is. And then this is what's called the JSON file, which is the text readable file, a text file that different software can, can parse in different ways, but it's actually a spatial data file. You can make it more recognizable as such by adding a geo, making it a geo JSON extension. And then you're able to bring that data set into GIS software. Uh, I'm just going to bring it back into that same QGIS window, right? So that .geo.json makes QGIS and other software realize, oh, this is a spatial data set. I can work with it. And so now we have 
the heat vulnerability index. Let me turn off some of those other layers. Right, this is the heat vulnerability index at the scale of neighborhood tabulation areas. It's just the data set, and we can style it accordingly. So graduated, actually, it'll work a bit better by categories, data value, let's do roads. Right, so this is now showing the heat vulnerability index by a neighborhood tabulation area directly from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'll note that there are some areas that don't have any polygons. It's kind of tough to see, but like the major parks don't have a polygon, like Central Park and Prospect Park, break tilled out by Staten Island. That's because those are unpopulated areas that are separated in the neighborhood tabulation area data. There's just inherently no no index for those spaces. These are some of the kind of core open data sets related to the urban forest and the report that we leverage and that you can explore on your own. All right. Thank you all so much for your time. And we really want to you know, thank everyone you presented. Uh, thanks so much, Natalia and Elena and Kurt and Fiona. It's really great to have such a wonderful community of folks who think about and work with these data and realizing that there's so many more of us in New York City parks and beyond. <laughs> yeah. And thanks again to... New York City Parks for sharing and showcasing the story map and their hard work on it. Have a wonderful evening.